This video is designed to teach you about electron microscopes. There's two different kinds. The first kind we're going to look at are referred to as scanning electron microscopes, or this is sometimes abbreviated as SEM for short. Uh, scanning electron microscopes are huge pieces of equipment. I mean, it can take up a whole entire section of a laboratory when you have one of these things. And if we look at this one uh, here in the picture, you can see that they're always coupled with a computer. So this is the scanning electron microscope on the side. The computer then reads the data that gets put out by the microscope. Now these microscopes are much more complicated than the ones we're using in class, but they're also much more powerful. We're limited to around 400 times magnification. These can go up into the hundreds of thousands of times for magnification. So even though they're much more complex, you're getting a much greater image out of them. Since it's a scanning electron microscope, these are just looking at the outside of whatever it is that's being examined under the microscope itself. And also, another thing we can get from the name is the idea that they're using electrons. So electrons are the negative part of the atom the downside to using these in the microscope is that they're very, very sensitive. Uh, scanning electron microscopes actually have to be used in a vacuum, otherwise the electrons would bounce off of particles in the air. So when the electrons are shot out through the top portion of the microscope, they actually bounce back off of the specimen, and it acts almost like radar or sonar, where it gives the scientists an image on the computer depending on how long it takes for the electrons to bounce back to the sensor inside of the microscope itself. So to get a look at the actual chamber where the scientists are putting the specimens, keep in mind this has got to be inside of a vacuum. So there's a special chamber here that they're using where they're putting the individual specimen that they're looking at. Uh, to give you an idea of some of the things that scientists might look at under a scanning electron microscope, this is an example of a sample of different pollen grains. So anybody in the room who has allergies, you can imagine these are the things that are irritating your eyes, your nose, your throat when you have allergies during the year. And it's easy to see why that irritates you know, the inside of your body when they have all those little sort of spines on the outside of the pollen grains to help them to stick to things. Another example of something that you might see under a scanning electron microscope are mites. So these are little tiny, um, nearly microscopic mites. And you can see they're actually on somebody's skin, so up close your skin looks very dry and kind of uh, crusty. And so scientists can look at these things very carefully under the microscope. The scanning electron microscope gives them a view of the outside of the specimen without actually cutting anything in half. Uh, the last example here is the way some things have to be prepared. This is an example of a spider that was used in a scanning electron microscope, and you can see it's actually covered in gold. If they're using larger specimens, scientists have to cover things in some kind of reflective material that'll bounce the electrons back. Uh, sometimes gold is used, platinum, other metals like that that will actually reflect the electrons. Uh, this can be a very expensive process, and the sample preparation here is certainly a lot more extensive than what we're seeing for our light microscopes in class. The other kind of microscope that's used are the transmission electron microscopes, Sometimes this one is abbreviated as just TEM. Now with transmission electron microscopes, they're still relatively complicated, just like the scanning electron ones we were seeing before. Let's get that one out of the way. Um, our transmission electron microscopes are still connected to a computer, although here you'll see the scientist does have the traditional kind of viewfinder that we're used to thinking of when we have the microscopes in class, but it's connected to this giant vacuum tube, because again, it's shooting those electrons, so it has to be done inside of a vacuum. Uh, the difference with the transmission electron microscope compared to the scanning electron microscope is that the transmission electron one has to have the specimens cut very, very thinly in order for the electrons to actually pass through them. Uh, to give you an example of an image that scientists are seeing with this, uh, this is one of the organelles actually inside of a cell which you'll learn about in a later video. This is called the mitochondria. And uh, this is an actual transmission electron image of this organelle, which is extremely small. You have to remember, this is a little tiny organelle inside of a cell, and you can actually see the individual layers of the membrane on the inside of the cell here. One of the things 
uh, that you'll learn about the mitochondria is that it has two layers of membranes and its own DNA. So you can actually see some of those details in that image. Uh, it's interesting to contrast this with the kind of cartoonish pictures that often show up in a lot of the textbooks. Uh, just a few other specimens with transmission electron microscopes. We've got an example of, um, this is a bacteriophage, which is a, a type of virus that actually attaches to uh, bacteria. This is a bacteria cell. We've got some plant cells. This is the Golgi apparatus, which is actually inside of um, some of the, the cells that we'll be looking at. That's an organelle inside of the cells. These are some plant cells. Or, I'm sorry, these are the, the lung tissue cells. And then these guys over here are some plant cells. So we've got a few different examples of things. Um, obviously something like this with the, the virus, you would never be able to see that with one of our microscopes in class. Uh, same thing with something like this with the Golgi apparatus. You just can't see those kinds of details. Uh, the transmission electron microscope produces an extremely high level of magnification. These can actually get close to one million times magnification. The only limit with the transmission electron microscopes is called resolution. Now, a good example of that is this little spider. Uh, this image that I found, I, I liked it. I think it's a cool representation of how specimens are prepared for a scanning electron microscope. The problem is the image was kind of small. So if I blow it up and make it really, really big, it sort of loses its resolution. It gets all pixelated and grainy, and it's hard to see anything in this image. But if you keep it relatively small, you know, it looks okay. So the same kind of thing works with the transmission electron microscope. As things get really big, we kind of start to lose that resolution, and you can't see things as clearly. A good example of that are these guys with the, uh, the mitochondria. They are very small, so you can see the resolution isn't quite as good there as compared to this one when, say, we're looking at the plant cells. Over here, you have much higher resolution. The picture is much clearer, whereas something tinier like a virus, which is very, very small, far smaller than even the, uh, the bacteria cell there. Now we're getting very tiny, it's kind of getting grainy, and we're losing some of that resolution. So currently that's the only thing that's really limiting our transmission electron technology is the resolution of the actual image. We can magnify things um, far beyond what we can actually see because it kind of gets grainy and pixelated at that point. So this explains to you the two different kinds of microscopes beyond just the simple light microscopes that we're using in class. Thank you for watching.